before uh, we got into the sermon, I did want to um, acknowledge acknowledge the tragedy in Charleston that's happened. Um, and uh, if you missed the vigil service that we had on Friday, it was very beautiful and, and, and a, good, a good way to remember uh, these lives tragically lost. Um, as we gather here this morning, uh, I wanted to say that we, we gather in defiance of Dylan Roof's desire to create a race war and in defiance of the idea that you can hate someone because of the color of their skin or their background or, or whatever else. Uh, and this is a picture we are a picture gathered here, uh, people from almost every race I can think of, together united in one body in Christ. And um, it's a beautiful thing. And we mourn uh, for that tragedy, our brothers and sisters. And thank you, David, for sharing, uh, for sharing about Syria and giving us that update and being vulnerable uh, in the pain that you're experiencing as you learn from these brothers and sisters from Syria. Um, it is tragic. What do we do when we're faced with crippling doubt? What is our response as God's people to incapacitating grief or justice miscarried? What do we do with a crisis of faith? Or perhaps more importantly, how does God handle it? Does he spurn us, punish us? not care. 2,500 years ago, there was a man living in the Middle East named Asaph. He was the chief singer and musician in the temple worship, ministering during the time of King David, according to First Chronicles, charged with performing many of the psalms you and I still read in the book Between Our Hands or the text on our phones. Um, <clears throat> Music attributed to him and his family was even described as prophecy. He was a religious and community leader. He spoke a very different language than you do, lived in a very different culture and geopolitical climate and technological age than you do. His world was, in fact, in most ways, very different from the world that you and I live in right now. But Asaph, a man of God, and a man of faith, perhaps not unlike yourself, had to grapple with those same questions on a painfully real level. And 2,500 years ago, after his ordeal, he decided to record his story in all its raw honesty. A temple musician, he naturally wrote his story in the form of a poem, a psalm. Instead of writing out simple, clean, correct theological responses, to those questions, his poem takes us on a journey uh, from grief, despair, and doubt to what was for Asaph an unexpected ending and resolution. And this poem from the prophet musician Asaph, this journey is sacred to us to this day, and we hallow it as scripture. Uh, open your Bibles to Psalm 73. And I hope the coffee's not too distracting. My throat's been scratchy the past few days. I kind of need to drink something. Psalm 73. Um, Asaph begins the psalm with a statement of orientation. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. A normative statement like this can be made in untested, sometimes unthinking, and shallow faith by those whose zeal perhaps surpasses their wisdom or experience. Well, God is good, that kind of thing. For Asaph, that statement has survived a crucible uh, of experiences, as we'll see. He goes on in verse 2. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. Asaph immediately challenges the confident declaration of verse 1 based on his experience. Surely God is good to Israel, but as for me, I nearly toppled. I almost stumbled. The image of feet slipping derives from the metaphor that one's conduct and choices are like walking along a path 
So Moses says in Deuteronomy 5, So you must ensure that you obey all that the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk entirely on the path God commands you. In other words, turning to the right or to the left means that you're starting to walk down the wrong path. Um, So by putting it this way, by saying my feet almost slipped, I almost stumbled, Asaph is essentially diving right into his struggle. And he says, I'll tell you the story of when I almost abandoned God's path. A leader, a temple musician. You have my attention, Asaph. Verses 3 through 12 begin the meat of the story. He says in verse 3, For I was envious of the arrogant, as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They've set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore, his people return to his place and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Yet always at ease, they have increased in wealth. Who are the wicked people, exactly, so that we understand who he's talking about? A more helpful term for the Hebrew word rasha, here translated wicked, uh, I think is the faithless. One commentator defines it this way, the wicked or faith, to be wicked or faithless is to fail to keep your commitments to God and to people. Practically, this means that they're the liars, the cheaters, two-faced, betraying friends and family for gain, deceivers lying in wait on secluded roads to murder and steal, taking life wantonly. They're self-serving and and caring nothing of the welfare of the community. Instead, they live their lives with unbridled appetite and greed at the expense of others. And by doing all these things knowingly, and they brazenly defy God. If you looked at the word rasha, wicked or faithless, throughout the Old Testament, these are the kinds of descriptions you'd find. This is who the wicked are. So Asaph watches the faithless in his community, the wicked, wicked, and he's dismayed to find that they're living prosperous lives. We may be tempted to judge Asaph for his jealousy, but before we do uh, judge Asaph from our moral high ground, sitting in the pews with our theology cleanly intact this morning, consider the following verses he'd heard who knows how many times before. This is from Deuteronomy 30. God says, So, see, I have set before you today life and prosperity, and death and adversity, in that I commanded you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, so that, so that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you're entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not obey the wicked, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will surely perish. You will not prolong your days. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life. Life was God, and God was life for the community of Israel and the covenant that he'd made with them. That was, that was their relationship, essentially. Psalm 5 says this, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful will not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. Psalm 19, in keeping the commands of the Lord, there's great reward. Psalm 25, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness, chesed, and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Psalm 41, how blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. The Lord will protect him and keep him alive, and he will be called blessed upon the earth. He will not be given over to the desire of his enemies. The Lord will sustain him upon his sickbed. In his illness, he will be restored to health. Psalm 145, the Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Psalm 119, those who love your law have great peace. Shalom. And nothing causes them to stumble. Finally, Isaiah 48, there is no peace for the wicked, no shalom for the rasha, says God. The core claim of Israel's faith is that God is utterly reliable. 
And so God's loyal love or faithfulness, his chesed, if you, a word you've probably heard before, is celebrated throughout the Hebrew Bible, particularly in the praises of the Psalms. The same Psalms that Asaph sung every week in the temple. So Asaph is completely scandalized. He observes the exact opposite and can't push the thought out of his mind. In a moment of honesty, of raw honesty, he says, I'm looking around right now, and it's the wicked who have peace and prosperity, God, not the righteous. Didn't Isaiah tell us there's no peace for the wicked? How can this be? And in seeing this, he, brought to, um, he was brought to en envy the wicked, the faithless. He gives us a laundry list of description of their deplorable character. Verse 6, they totally disregard God, their arrogance, and do life by means of lawless violence. Makes me think of Syria. Verse 7, both the eye and the heart here represent their desire. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if your eye is clear and your whole body, then your whole body will be full of light, referring to generosity. A clear eye was an open heart and an open hand, as it were. Um, uh, the people Asaph sees here, in stark contrast, have bulging eyes and hearts running rampant, meaning they live life according to their unbridled, unbridled desires and greed and appetite, and at whoever's expense, which is what we see in verse 8. They mock and deride from their places of privilege instead of helping and serving. The phrase speaking of oppression elsewhere clearly means extortion, strong-arming people who are less fortunate and less powerful to rob them of money and livelihood just so that you can gain more wealth. They're also powerful. Verse 9 uses a poetic device called merism to get the point across, which is where you see two extremes that denote the totality of something, such as, as far as the east is from the west, so God has removed our sins, meaning as far as ways you can possibly get. Or Jesus says, you know, God, Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth means Lord of everything. Um... Here in verse 9, the wicked, the faithless people, Asaph sees, have broad influence. Setting their mouths in heaven and parading their tongues on the earth, meaning that what they say goes wherever they go. They have power. I won't get into the technicalities now, only for lack of time. But the first part of verse 10, uh, which the NASB, which is what I'm reading, uh, reads, therefore his people return to his place, is probably better translated. Um as thus blows come repeatedly to his, that is, God's people. Meaning these faithless actively oppress God's people. And what's the result? Look at the second line in verse 10. Waters of abundance are drunk by them. It's a confusing statement. Uh, typically, abundant waters represent overwhelming anger or distress in the Old Testament. An example is the Assyrian army coming uh, to destroy Israel and sack all of her cities in Isaiah 8. Uh, it's described as an overwhelming flood. Um, so here, instead of receiving their just judgment from God, the abundant waters coming to overwhelm them, they elude judgment. They drink the waters, as it were. And the victims of their utterly selfish lives re receive no justice. To add insult to injury, they confidently assert that God doesn't really know or care. Verse 11. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? The answer is no, there's not, as far as they're concerned. What would these people look like today? The Wiccan. Sometimes these, this flurry of descriptions can make us feel detached. These are the kind of people who extort undocumented immigrants for cheap labor. The kind of people who steal girls and make them sex slaves and sell them to the wealthy for easy money. The kind of people who would infiltrate a drug rehab facility disguised as an addict just to sell drugs for an easy profit, get people hooked again. The kind of people who would lie, to publicly, get elect lie publicly to get elected, who would enter places of worship to murder the innocent, who would betray family and friends for personal gain, who lie and manipulate. These are the wicked. These are the faithless. After, his, after this flurry of description, Asaph's conclusion is a fitting summary, and lets us know how he feels. Verse 12, Behold, 
These are the wicked and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. The word translated behold in most versions is the word hine. And it's used throughout the Old Testament. Anywhere you see behold, it's this word. It's used throughout the Old Testament to direct our attention towards something. So, you know, in the middle of a story, and I say, and then behold, the angel of the Lord. Look, it's the angel of the Lord, essentially. Look is a good translation. Behold sounds so archaic to us. Look, it was the angel of the Lord. Just, you're, we're in the story. And from Asaph's point of view, he's like, look, God, these are the wicked. They are the definition of wicked. And they have ease and prosperity. Continually. Look at that. They have continual prosperity. They're always at ease. It's ongoing. This isn't just a week-long thing for Asaph. You know, put him in a slump. It's a lifelong thing. And it's the opposite of what God said. For Asaph, he's looking at this situation saying, this is the exact opposite of all the psalms that I sing and all the verses that I read and all the promises in Deuteronomy and elsewhere that I see. It's the opposite. Now, why would a man of God envy, after all, such deplorable people? Because they had something that, according to Scripture, Asaph had been promised. He's suffering. Remember verse 10, they actively oppress God's people. He's suffering, and they're not. And he can't handle it anymore. God said the faithless would be destroyed, but he sees them living lives of ease, not the righteous. Verse 4 they're the ones who die peacefully at 80, having lived full lives. They're the ones whose bellies bulge, and they don't have to deal with hunger like Asaph does. They don't have to toil day in and day out, verse 5, or deal with sickness. They're the perfect picture of health and wealth, the people who extort and lie and cheat and steal. And that's why, it's because of that health and wealth, that's why Asaph says, Notice how he begins verse 6 with therefore. That's why these stealers and manipulators and abusers continue to lie, cheat, steal, manipulate, abuse, extort, kill, and live lives of unbridled greed. From their perspective, they're doing just fine. Asaph is essentially calling God to count, you know? Like, you're letting them off the hook. And from their perspective, they say, I've completely disregarded God's standards until now. And I'm doing just great. I think I'll just keep doing this. Thanks. You keep going to the temple and praying to God for deliverance. Asaph is mocked by their prosperity as a man of God. Maybe you hear there an echo of Jesus' mockers as he hung on the cross. He trusts in God. Let God save him. Chips are on the table at this point. Because of this disconnect in reality, Asaph is distraught. These are the bad guys, God, and they're winning. I thought we were supposed to have peace, not the wicked. Weren't we supposed to be blessed? Not them. You're completely letting them off the hook. So, in this beginning, in this opening section where we see Asaph's complaint and setting the stage, Instead of chesed, God's loyal love, God's faithfulness to his people, Asaph felt the opposite. He felt betrayed by God. He'd put his faith in God and the opposite of what God had promised was happening day in and day out, as we'll see. And that severe disconnect between his faith and reality led him, the faithful man, the leader in the community, the temple singer, the prominent person, led him to a very startling conclusion because of that disconnect. As he moves in the psalm from the them of the wicked to himself, me, Asaph. It's verse 13. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. It's all been for nothing, he says. My careful obedience, my not turning to the right or the left, the tension is, is heightened even more by the poetry here. He begins this verse with the same word, ach, meaning surely, that he began verse 1 with. 
Surely God is good to Israel. Ach tov l'Israel is matched with surely in vain I've obeyed God and washed my hands in innocence. The image in the verse of washing hands and purifying your heart is of internal and external purity. Internally, Asaph had cleansed his heart in that quite unlike the wicked, he had guarded and bridled his intentions and his desires according to God's purposes. Whereas the wicked let their appetite run rampant. Asaph hadn't done that, he'd obeyed God. And externally, washing his hands mean that, means that he'd maintain purity of his actions as well. In contrast to the violence and extortion of the wicked. This imagery, washing hands and purifying hearts, just to give us kind of what this would have meant to Asaph, derives ultimately from his trips to the temple, where, comparable to the ritual washing of contemporary Islam before prayer services in the mosque, the righteous worshipers underwent a ritual washing um, and other external acts and sacrifices and etc. that demonstrated their internal purity. And this is the context of a very familiar verse from Psalm 24, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? We sing songs about it. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, has not sworn deceitfully, in other words, the wicked can't, he, that person, will receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The hill of the Lord there is a very literal place. It was the Temple Mount where Israelites worshipped. Remember, these psalms were recited in, the te in their temple worship by Asaph, the chief singer. You probably knew this one very well. He had undergone that ritual, those ritual washings, that, that intentional entrance into the temple since his youth, and his whole life had approached the temple and approached God with righteousness and the integrity of his heart. I've been obeying you. I've been obeying you, God. But his youthful faith now waned, and he didn't see the blessing from the Lord promised to the righteous worshipers in the psalm that he'd sang so many times. That person will receive a blessing in the Lord. He's looking around, he's like, it's the opposite. The blessing wasn't happening. And he explains in verse 14 exactly how it's the opposite. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Stricken here is physical. He's being abused. Chastened is verbal. So while the wicked enjoy continual prosperity, remember that from verse 12, always at ease. While the wicked enjoy continual prosperity, he describes his physical abuse as all day long and his chastening as every morning. In light of the promises of peace and prosperity we read, we too might despair as Asaph did. Maybe for us it's because we see science and scripture at odds. Or maybe it's manipulation by the church, betrayal at the hands of God's people. I've seen it happen. Maybe even physical assault. Maybe it's not being able to hold down a job, a child dying of, a can of cancer, or a mother, feeling unloved, unwanted, unappreciated, taken advantage of, Exper experiencing depression without any clear feeling of anything and no way out. Maybe it's murder. as we painfully remember Charleston. David pointed out, and this was a complete coincidence as it were, our brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters, our family are being killed and raped in Eastern Iraq by members of the Islamic State. We might be driven to conclude in those situations what Asaph did. It's all been for nothing. I was the fool. My religious life has been pointless. It's hard to envision. It's hard to envision the darkest night of your life until you've been there. It really is. Asaph felt betrayed by everything he committed his life to. And in the throes of his physical suffering and his mental anguish, he also found himself alone. That's what he says in verse 15. If I had said, I will speak thus. In other words, if I had said, I'm going to tell this story to someone, 
Look, again, look. I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Despite everything, Asaph resolves to maintain his integrity. integrity. He couldn't fathom, as a leader of his people, a well-known figure in the faith community, publicly contradicting the faith of his people. He couldn't, he couldn't fathom doing that. So, not only, was he suff- not only was his suffering unbearable and, frankly, incomprehensible, he couldn't understand it. In light of what God had said, he was utterly alone in his suffering. He felt completely distanced from God on the one hand and unable to share it with even his closest friends on the other, lest he lead them to wander off the God's path as he saw himself doing in that very moment. In that seclusion and silence and pain, he tried to piece his fractured reality back together. That's what he says in verse 16. When I pondered to understand this, It was troublesome in my sight. His moral and ethical universe, everything that he believed in for his whole life, was a thousand pieces of shattered glass on the floor in front of him, which means that his heart, think about that, his heart and his soul was a thousand pieces of shattered glass on the floor in front of him. But no matter how much he thought about it, he couldn't put the pieces back together into a whole. He couldn't make sense of it. He couldn't rectify what God had said versus what God was doing, or particularly in this case, not doing. If God truly took no pleasure in the wickedness and if the arrogant could not stand in his presence, as we read in Psalm 5, how could he, a righteous man, be suffering every day? How could the corrupt, the faithless, be living in prosperity? Where was God? Asaph, sitting quiet, Uh, They're sitting in a quiet and probably dusty room, if you've ever been to Israel, overlooking the rocky, rolling hills of the Promised Land. Did not have an answer to that question. Where was God? And the more he thought about it, the more troublesome his thoughts became. He was entirely bewildered. In a normal lament psalm, based on where this psalm is about to go, in a normal lament psalm, this is where the poet would beg for God's deliverance. Asaph is telling us a story. It's not exactly a lament. And so he doesn't include this request. That's part of the story. And I think perhaps this is is a case of something's absent that's usually there. And I think perhaps he felt so estranged from God and so bewildered by the injustice that he saw and the disconnect between faith and reality that he was saying that he couldn't even utter a request for God's deliverance. He suffered in silence alone. God was absent. Look at verses 2 through 16. Where do you see God in those verses? Nowhere. Except on the mocking lips of the people who extort Asaph and oppress him. It's the only place. One dusty Thursday morning or maybe it was the evening of the Sabbath. I don't really know. Asaph got up. His situation hadn't changed. Um, But he wasn't going to neglect the duties of the temple. On this particular day of worship, though, he had a profound experience. I'll read verse 16 again and then read verse 17. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. He couldn't make sense of any of it until until I came to the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Asaph stood in the temple precincts watching the throng of worshipers approach the temple. Now, this was a daily thing. And he saw how their numbers dwindled as they drew nearer to the Holy of Holies, the the most holy inner sanctum, the place where God said, this is where I am, this is where I'm going to dwell among my people. Walking from the porch past the brazen altar, through the outer courts into the grand sanctuary of the temple with cherubim carved on the wall and palm trees signifying God's life-giving presence. The faithless, the wicked, the oppressors, the extorters, the violent, the deceitful, the murderers, the arrogant, they were forbidden the privilege of God's presence. They were compelled, they had to, to stay outside the temple 
outside the precincts, outside the Temple Mount. They weren't allowed to go. The temple was where God himself dwelt among his people. And his presence, as we read, brought peace, prosperity, fruitfulness, deliverance, and more. And, uh, and as we read earlier in Psalm 24, the righteous person who enters the presence of God, that presence, will receive a blessing from God. In that moment, a flip switched somehow for Asaph. His circumstances hadn't changed. But he was watching the wicked be excluded from the presence of God on the temple mount. They were excluded from his holy presence, right? I'm a holy God, and that's why there are all these rituals were there in the first place. And by extension, they were excluded from his blessings, his mercy, his faithful love. He saw what Psalm 5 said. The, the arrogant cannot stand in his presence, quite literally cannot stand in his presence. They're not allowed to go to the temple. That reality, the reality of that verse was being acted out before his eyes, kind of like a cathedral it points up to God, right? They were intentionally designed structures. They point up to God, and they're lined with these windows that tell stories of Jesus, originally for the illiterate. And Asaph sees something similar. Just like a cathedral has meaning, the acts of worship that Israelites were doing, going to the temple, had meaning. And he saw the wicked being excluded. He saw God's justice being enacted and his blessing of life and peace being given, as it were. That profound day for Asaph, worship recontextualized his suffering and it recontextualized the absence of God that he had been feeling. In verse 3, he said he saw the prosperity of the wicked. That's what he was observing with his own two eyes. He saw the prosperity of the wicked. But after his profound experience at the temple, he says in verse 17, he recognized or understood. Then I perceived their end, is how the NASB puts it. It was an inward perception. He perceived the end that their path leads to. And that perception allows him to reaffirm what the prophets and poets had always said. Verses 18 through 20. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. Seeing this in the temple made him realize something he already knew. They will be judged. They will be judged. And there's a happy reversal that takes place. Where he was in danger of slipping in verse 2, now he sees the ever prosperous wicked set on slippery places. They will be destroyed. They will be excluded, the faithless. They will come to a sudden and terrifying end. The imagery in these verses is comparable maybe to a tsunami rising out of the ocean. One minute, these people who have gained everything that they have by abusing and taking advantage of and extorting people are sipping pina coladas on the beach, enjoying their wealth that they've acquired with violence, without a care in the world. Then a wave starts to rise out of the ocean. First, you don't think anything about it, but it doesn't stop. It rises and rises and rises, and in an instant, in an instant, they realize what's happening. There's no high ground. There's nowhere for them to run. They face imminent destruction and death. Like a dream when one awakes, you will despise their form, Asaph says. In a moment, like the waking of a dream, they receive their judgment. And you can imagine how terrifying it would be looking at that wave and not being able to do anything except meet your end. This revelation, this experience at the temple gave Asaph renewed confidence in his God. God had not abandoned justice. God had not abandoned his people. The faithless are excluded from his presence. He was watching it happen with his own eyes. And so he was able to look at the prosperous, powerful, wicked in a new light, with a new understanding. They were going to meet their rightful end. The oppressors, the thieves, the abusers, they would meet a sudden and terrifying destruction as recompense for their arrogant, abusive, manipulative ways that disregarded God, his kingdom, and the peace and justice that he commanded of his people. They ignored that and instead abused people, people made in the image of God, made in God's image. Asaph, as it were, the person being oppressed, the righteous follower of God, would receive justice. I think it's interesting that the psalm doesn't end there, because it could, right? Asaph had his theological answer, as it were. But I think that it doesn't end there as telling, 
Asaph doesn't choose to end his experience with that theological answer. He explains how his change from doubt, to dis- from doubt and despair to faith happened. Here's, here's how it happened. It was the startling and very unexpected presence of God. He sets the stage first by returning to his pain. Verses 20 and 21. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 21 22. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Emotionally, he felt stabbed through the, with a spear, and his heart was bitter, uh, a word elsewhere describing vinegar. Uh, indeed, being under attack from people and having God sit and do nothing is a devastating thing on one's spirit. He was broken, as we would say. He described it as being stabbed in the heart with a spear. And the effect was toxic. I was ignorant like a beast. The term for beast here is behemoth. In Hebrew, it's, uh, it's a Hebrew word, and it's where we get our, our word behemoth from, as it were. It's the exact same word. Asaph is essentially saying, my jealousy and my pain made me utterly monstrous with you, God. And it's true. We remember. We read verses 3 through 12. We know exactly how he was feeling, what he was thinking. He felt betrayed. He felt distance, and nothing made sense, and he felt alone. But then comes the surprise. Verses 23 through 26 tell us how God responded to brutish, monstrous, hurting Asaph, his unexpected ending to the story. And it's one of the most profound truths. If you take nothing else away from this, it's one of the most profound truths you can learn about God. Listen to this. Nevertheless, Monstrous Asaph says this. Nevertheless, I am continually with, with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Who do I have in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on this earth. My flesh and my heart have failed. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In his darkest moment, his darkest moment, of pain and doubt and feeling completely and utterly alone. It turns out that God had never left. God had never left. The presence of God in Asaph's life penetrated the deep darkness, melancholy, and doubt. And even though Asaph thought he was entirely absent, he didn't feel it, but God was there. And in that very real pit of despair, God reached out and took him by the hand. He never abandoned Asaph or even waited for him to get his act together or pray more or push away those evil thoughts, Asaph, with the love of a father, the love of a father. God met his child in that place, took him by his hand and helped guide him out, confused and scared. But for Asaph, that was enough. If he was clinging to life and faith by a string, a thread, It was the guarantee of God's presence that was enough for him. Even more than the assurance that God would bring about justice, as we just read, and he did need to know that. That was part of the problem. Asaph needed God himself. Asaph needed God himself. And that fact, that fact of God's faithfulness, that God stuck it out with him and didn't leave and came to him, came to him, that reality changed Asaph. It changed him from a wounded monster, a wounded monster bearing his fangs to a wounded person clinging to God again, if barely. And in that journey from doubt to faith, God had never left him. He was committed to the end. King David put the same thought this way in another psalm that's very familiar. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the place of the dead, look, you're there. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, surely the darkness will overwhelm me. Even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as day. How precious are your thoughts of me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. 
God's chesed, his loyal love, was on trial in verses 2 through 12. That's what was missing. Asaph thought God had abandoned him. Now as the dust settles, Asaph grasps God's faithfulness in a way he couldn't have imagined. God's supportive, covenant, active, I'll never leave, blessing, suffer with you, presence was there even at rock bottom. It turned out that Asaph hadn't kept his hands and heart pure in vain, although he didn't know it at the time. He didn't know it at the time. It turned out that God's presence and blessing and support was not a hoax, after all. The man acquainted with sorrows, the Messiah who hung from a cross and screamed while dying, why have you abandoned me, God? That now risen and exalted Messiah said, I will never leave you to us. I'm with you always, even to the end. Sometimes he seems absent. It's true. We suffer. We strive. We're taken advantage of. We're extorted. We're abused. We're humiliated. We sense no peace that we were promised peace. We feel no power that we were promised power. And we see no justice. <clears throat> we see no justice. Though he said he'd bring a kingdom of peace and righteousness. In the worst cases, we're killed in senseless violence or specifically because we follow Christ as our brothers and sisters are today in Iraq and Syria. And we can't make sense of the violence. There are times when in moments of honesty, like Asaph had a moment of honesty, we can't make sense of the violence. And that's what Asaph saw. But even in the emptiness, and even in the deep pain, the deep pain, remember how he described it. God says, I'll never leave you. We have the company in our grieving of one acquainted with grief and sorrow. That presence made all the difference for the man Asaph, whose suffering was intolerable and whose crisis of faith was severe enough to make him a religious leader almost walk away from God. But even then, God was there. Even then, God was there for his child, Asaph. And my brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters, because we are a family, God is here. If you yearn for him now, if that makes you yearn for God, press into him. Don't approach him with shame. Approach him like he's your father who loves you, takes you by the hand, guides you, and honors you, supports you both now and then finally in the end. Christian, you have not kept your hands clean in vain. You have not kept your heart pure in vain. In choosing God, a life of obedience to God, you have chosen the most faithful and loving companion you could ever have chosen. And he's with you to the end. He's with you to the end. I began by asking, what do you do when you're faced with crippling doubt? What do you do when depression or pain overtakes you? I think in the case of Asaph, the answer is not what you do, but who God is. And Asaph concludes his story this way, verses 27 and 28. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all of your works. Even though he didn't feel it, remember, his situation hasn't changed even at the end of this psalm. Even though he didn't feel it, he said the nearness of God is my good, it's my confidence, even though my heart is dead. And if you take away one verse from this whole message, or one idea, I hope it's this one. My flesh and my heart have failed. It's the simplest way to translate the verse. Most of them say may fail, have failed. My, my flesh and my heart have failed, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Your emotions will run out, just, but his strength will not, nor will his covenant with you through Jesus Christ till the end. Until the end. Let's pray. God, give us 
the vibrant faith of Asaph, who dared brutal honesty with you and with your people, and because of it knew you more deeply than he had imagined. He knew you beyond the fickleness of his emotions, and because of that journey, he has encouraged believers for 2,500 years after his death because of it. Increase our faith. Help us to perceive your presence beyond our grief and pain and suffering. And Jesus, we wait for you for your final coming, where your presence will fill the world forever and darkness will be a memory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Here at Loft, we remember Jesus through communion every week. Just as he said, do this in remembrance of me. While Ng and the band plays, you can come up and grab a cup with the elements, and we'll remember it together afterward. <clears throat>